Scenic painting is very much a physical medium. I encourage you to try these techniques in any way that you can using the materials that you have at hand. And you'll see some of these lend themselves to household material use, uh, not just fancy brushes and fancy paints. I like to begin with a video from American Theatre Wing's interview with scenic charge artist Jason Edwards. I think it, he nicely encapsulates um, what the job of a scenic charge artist or scenic painter is. And if you pay attention to the video, you'll see a little preview of some of the stuff we're going to talk about, such as working with a grid, dry brushing, scumbling, using a liner brush, uh, etc., etc. Plain and simple. I just like to create this illusion for people that, you know, don't realize that that's just a piece of wood. That's what I like. I'm Jason Edwards. I'm a scenic charge artist. A scenic charge artist is somebody who uh, takes uh, drawings and renderings and elevations from a, a scene designer and will basically make it really happen. It could be anything from just doing a simple white wash or a wet blending of two colors, or it could be something highly detailed where you're doing a full drop that is usually the thing that people will act in front of, or, or a set. Um, sometimes we'll also will paint props. This laying is like, you know, scenic artist, um, painter, artist, you know, paint guy, the one with all the messy clothes. I also like to think that sometimes we're the third string quarterback of a scene design when a designer and their assistant isn't around and there's some kind of aesthetic question that you know they, I have to answer just for their sake. I've always liked drawing and painting. I always enjoyed doing that. And I went to an art high school and that was kind of my first exposures of that until one day they needed somebody to paint something for guys and dolls for high school. And that really was what the, awoke the beast, so to speak. And I just started to just fall in love with scene painting and started pursuing a, a path in that direction. When I went to college, I went to North Carolina School of the Arts. So I went to another art school. So uh, in that school, they have a scenic art program that's just, that's all you do. You eat, sleep, and breathe scenic art, you know, and drawing and doing more drawing and more painting and more painting. It's just because of that experience, it, it basically, I. I guess we're here, man. I'm right now. I'm a charge artist for Woolly Mammoth. I've been here for two years now. In terms of a, a scenic charge artist, or as an art scenic artist, you basically will paint everything known to man. I've painted carpet, I've painted plexiglass, and I've painted shower curtains. You know, because it's especially with theater, and one of the reasons why I'm kind of drawn to it is you work with all these different materials that are kind of everyday materials, but you reuse it for something else that you wouldn't even thought of. Here I might, you know, end up using vermiculite to make um, shingles, or painting, you know, plexiglass to make it look like it's you know, a hockey ring ice. So, with theater, with the scenic, you um, you have to keep in mind that you have people out there in the audience, and they have wandering eyes. You know, and they start looking around and go, oh, "Look at that! That looks like raw wood." If you have a balcony like we have here. Uh, you know, have to make sure the tops and stuff are painted, you know. Um, then you have to also worry about sight lines when doors, you know, stuff need to be black or does it need to be this, that, and the other. You usually, I usually ask the urban designer a simple question, do I need to follow this literally or not? And they basically say yes or no. Um, with this set, for an example, the designer uh, kept talking about stained and pickled wood. And, go, oh, okay, so uh, you go in there, okay, what colors would you like it? You go back and forth about that kind of stuff, and I start doing samples. And then I start doing the samples and figure out, okay, how much white, how much more water, less water, you know, or this, that, and the other. I kind of think of all the science of it, you know, how much is the wood going to absorb. With the walls on this particular show, when I did water first, and then basically as the wood was still wet, and then I added uh, paint to it, and a very washy paint, and or, or glazy paint, and then, uh, then used my big brush, the broom, and just kind of evened it all out. If you can, uh, if you see, it kind of gets dark at top and then kind of stops a little, fades. And so the dark kind of helps you consciously or subconsciously kind of keep your eyes back down to what's going on on the stage. I'm pretty much, um, you know, always have to think outside the box. So pretty much, I just live outside the box. My the sleeping bag's right next to it. Um, the the thing is, is that you know, for each project, there is something unique that you have to just simply figure it out. And it is simple by trial and error. Um, 
And one thing that I did learn in school is about the trial and error. You just do samples, samples, and samples, you know, and you figure out what's going to work, what's not going to work. So you kind of are able to narrow it down. The more you stay in, you know, the more you do it. But if you're just starting out in the beginning, you wouldn't know what to do. You just have to do samples, and you just have to learn just by trial and error. And that's how I, I stumble on kind of these crazy little ideas, you know. Uh, and this was Boom. And uh, Tom, the designer, he when he came in, uh, he pretty much handed us uh, prints, blueprints, and uh, a model. His research was simply like, look around Wooly. Uh, you've got a lot of concrete. If you need, you know, reference, just look at the concrete you have. So that's what I did. So if you look closely, you could see that uh, the walls are all center block, and this was the the sample that I did. Um, this is what I was talking about uh, with the three eighths tape, with the masking tape. And just put a uh, joint compound on top of that and peeled up the tape and created that illusion. And uh, it, a lot of people bought it. What would make a good scenic painter, in my opinion, is just basically the, just the brush control. Uh, um, not afraid to draw, just, just draw, draw, draw. And mixing color. If, you know, um, if you can mix color like nobody's business, you know, being likes color with ease, just knowing and mastering a color wheel, basically. Uh, one of the reasons why I enjoy working for Woolly Mammoth is is because of some of the play choices they have. We all work with so many different designers, and they're always zany, and they always want to try to do something new and different, and uh, I'm all for it. And and they're willing to do that, and we're willing to try that, and we're trying to go as far as we can, of course, on a budget. But, you know, that's what the beauty of it is, too. Is since the, you know we may not have these astronomical budgets, and we have to work with what we have, and that's really the fun part. Say, like, well, how much from Mechalite can I get for doing over three thousand square feet? You know that kind of stuff. That's also a challenge too, and uh, I enjoy that. Once everything is up and running, that opening night, uh, it, it's basically uh, it, it, relaxation. You know, and and I, I try not to. Get, uh, I don't know how I can get theater reaction, or I mean, a, a audience reaction. I'm not going to go up to the audience and say, so what do you think of this piece of wood? Ah, yeah. No, I, I don't really do that. Uh, I, I do feel like that if when you see, and I see a standing ovation at the end of the night for that performance, uh, it's like, okay, I did my part, you know, in helping tell the story that, you know, that, it make, that makes me feel like I did a job. So what kind of materials are they using? Um, obviously, it would be paint and brushes primarily. There are a variety of different shapes and sizes and types of brushes. Um, on the left here, in these one, two, three, four, you can see there is um, a, a set of, of fine scenic artist brushes. These are specifically for scenic painting, but you're obviously not limited to those kinds of brushes. Uh, on the left, number one, we have a Fitch, which is a round-headed Fitch, and then two, we have a flat-headed Fitch, and number three is an angled Fitch. And I want you to notice that the ferrule, the silver part right here, that holds the bristles in and glued into the handle, um, the ferrules are crimped on these, so you get a fanned out kind of brush, so it gives you a much broader stroke, or you can turn it on edge, and then you get um, a, a nice straight line. Number four is a filbert, so the opposite of a fitch. Notice the ferrule is round, and so you get a round shape uh, to your bristles, and it's not going to um, fill as much space. You can't get a wide stroke with that, but you can get in and get detailed uh, and control it a little bit better. Number five is our good old friend, the chip brush, and these are the ones you can get really cheap if you go to like Lowe's or Home Depot. Uh, you know, a dollar, a dollar fifty a piece. These are the ones that, um, if you're painting, uh, if you're learning to paint, you start with these because if you mess it up and don't clean it, uh, no big deal, no harm, no foul, right? These other brushes, like the guys over here, a little more expensive. You don't want to mess those up. Um, you can also use just regular house painting brushes. We can see an example of a really beat up one here. The Brushes can be broken down into these parts. You have the bristles, which are, oops, excuse me, let me go backwards, which are um, generally synthetic, so made out of some sort of plastic. The ferrule, 
which is usually metal, and that's what holds the bristles in. There's a little bit of glue in there. And then the handle, which is the wooden or plastic part here. The bristles can be broken down into the toe, which is the edge, the belly, which is the fat part that holds most of your paint, uh, and then the heel, which is the part that tucks into the ferrule. Now this ferrule is really important. You want to take care of your brushes. You don't want them to fall apart. You don't want them to rust. Um, you don't want water to get into the ferrule and stay there for long because if it does, it'll rot out that glue, it'll rust out the ferrule itself, and those bristles will start coming out in chunks as you're painting, and nobody wants that. Not attractive. Um, the handle, notice it's usually kind of an ergonomic shape for your hand, although if you uh, paint for any amount of time with that handle, uh, you'll discover that they're not super ergonomic. They can cramp and hurt over time. So you'll want to make sure that you're um, stretching your hands and giving them a rest from time to time. Um, the bristles themselves, as I said, are usually synthetic, although on some of these um, finer artist brushes, they could be hay, uh, sable, horse hair. Um, they even make brushes out of human hair, although you're probably not going to be painting scenery with those. Notice the handle also has a little hole right here. This is for hanging it up to dry. You don't ever want to take a, um, a paintbrush and, and just stick it in a can to dry like this straight up and down or like these are straight up and down. You always want to find a way to either lay them on their side uh, so the bristles stay nice and flat or hang them up so the bristles hang down. Um, if you put it in bristle first um, to like a can to let it dry, uh, what will happen is those bristles will get smushed and they'll dry in a funny shape and then you've ruined your brush essentially. Also, if it's not put in, um, if it's not hung up to dry, then the, again, the water gets stuck in the ferrule and can ruin your brush. All right, so I mentioned brushes and paint are our two basic tools here. Well, there's two types of paint that you're probably going to run into. There's vinyl paint, which is often referred to as scenic paint, um, and probably the most well-known brand here in the United States is Roscoe. Um, we use a lot of off-Broadway in our shops. Um, Roscoe vinyl paint is um, very saturated. It holds up under strong lights. Um, it is definitely a higher quality paint. However, as you work, you might find that you are, all, you are also sometimes working with latex paint, regular house paint like you get from Home, home Depot or Lowe's. Um, it's available, it's easy to get, it's cheap. A gallon is about 20 bucks or so, um, whereas it might be two to three times that, um, depending on the color that you're buying from Roscoe. So you have quality versus availability and budget here. So parts of paint. If you've ever looked at an old can of paint, you'll notice that it separates after time. Um, and that's one reason that we stir it up every use because the vehicle binder and pigment, the three things the paint is made out of, will separate into three separate layers. And if you try to paint without mixing it up each time, um, you're not getting a nice equal blend. And it'll either be too clear or hazy or it just won't be quite right or not even the right color. So paint is made up of the vehicle, which is the liquid that keeps it moist. Um, it eventually evaporates and dries and then the uh, paint is left behind, the, the pigment is left behind on whatever you're trying to paint. So you want to make sure that liquid doesn't evaporate until you're ready, which is another reason um, you want to keep those lids on tight. Uh, you want, definitely want to hit it with a, a mallet, um, stand on it, put a foot on it, uh, make sure that it is sealed tight every single time because if you don't, um, and if you've ever had the misfortune of opening up a can of paint that let too much air in, one, it'll start to mildew and it'll get disgusting and it'll smell terrible. But two, it'll also completely dry out and then you're left with a hunk of binder and pigment at the bottom of your can, which is completely useless to you. The binder itself is what attaches the pigment or the paint to the surface that you're painting. So in latex paint, the binder is latex. So it's essentially like the glue, 
right? And then the pigment, which is what usually settles to the very bottom of the bucket, is what makes the color that color. So that's why if you don't stir it up, it won't be the right color. In fact, if you look at this can right here, um, this really grody can, um, you can see it started to separate in that it's not mixed up, so it just looks kind of like whitish right off-white color so you're seeing the vehicle which is mostly clear and the binder here and the pigment which looks like it's probably blue is at the very bottom um, so it's not even the right color until you stir it up so stirring it up very important do it every single time you use the paint all right different types of painting techniques we're going to go over six different painting techniques today ideally um, if we were in the same room, I would be able to demonstrate these for you and you would be able to try them out yourself. But I encourage you, if possible, to um, use what you have at hand uh, to try some of these techniques on your own. So the sponge technique is probably something that you can do. You might not have a natural sea sponge like this guy over here at home but if you have like a regular dishwashing sponge this can also work and um, you rough it up a little bit you put a little bit of paint on it and then you sponge it lightly onto the surface so usually this is a technique that you're going to use um two or three coats of paint in you've already put down a base coat or you've scumbled a couple of colors together and then you're going to sponge over top of that and see the bottom color come through the sponging this middle picture here, you can see an example of some white and it looks like dark gray sponging over brown or brownish gray. Here they've used some sponging in this marble technique. So you can see a little bit of black has been sponged on top of the green, a little bit of white sponged on top as well. And here to make pipe look like it's been corroded, it's older, it's starting to uh, uh, turn green. They just used green um, paint and sponged it on, right? So you can see the copper through. You can see the pipe coming through it. The scumble technique is a wet blend technique, and we use this one quite often in theater, where you take two or three colors, like here we've got blue, red, yellow, and you scumble or mix them together. So where they meet, you just feather them into each other and you get a third or in this case fourth color. Here you can see they use a scumble of different colors to create their continents and also for the water, different blues. Here they're doing a large scale uh, scumble for a backdrop. And here you can see underneath the lining and the um, spattering, you can see a little bit of scumble of like a dark gray and light gray here and then there's like a medium tone gray, and you just gently blended these together. And then that's as a basic technique, and then over top of that, they've done things like spatter and lining, which we'll talk about in just a second. The rag roll technique is using um, fabric, or really you could use plastic or any kind of um, uh, sheet good, right? And you roll it up and then get a little bit of paint on it, and roll it over your surface. So like sponging, you're gonna have a basic color that you've painted underneath, and then you're layering this on and you're seeing that base coat come through it. And so here you can see they, they're doing it by hand. Here she's using a, um, it looks like probably fabric that's been attached to a roller, um, like you take rubber bands and just rubber band it on. Here's a whole wall and you can kind of see the base color here where they haven't finished and then that darker color that they've rag rolled on top. Here they've done it with stripes and then rag rolled a color on top of it as well. Spatter technique, very handy, very useful. Um, it like the sponging technique and like the rag roll technique again it's usually a technique that goes on top of something else um, so for example this was painted gray and then they've spattered white and gray and black on top of it to give it texture this is how you do it by hand so you take your brush they've got a chip brush here the ferrule the metal part you would gently smack it against your hand and all the droplets, um, and you want to make sure it's a little wet, but it's not so wet that it, you're going to get big globs. 
um, all the droplets will go forward and will strike your surface. And how hard you hit it and how um, far back you swing it kind of changes the nature of the drops themselves. You always want to be careful though when you're spattering because on that backstroke, you could get it in your face, you can get it on scenery that's behind you, you can get it on people that's behind you, and they never like that. So you want to be careful. This is a messy technique. You want to make sure you're somewhere that you're not going to affect um, other scenery, props, costumes, God forbid, curtains, things like that. In the center here, um, this is that map again, and notice that's the scumble underneath, and then to kind of break it up and give it some texture, they've uh, spattered on top of it. Same thing here with the bricks, there's a scumble, and then on top of it, they've spattered with some black and white um, to give it some texture and give it some breakup. Another way to do this technique is to use a simple garden sprayer, like you can get here. This one's from Ace, Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart. Um, it's usually stuff you use to spray like, uh, like insect killer on your garden or, or weed stuff, things like that. Um, but you get a fresh one that hasn't been used for those purposes. And what you're going to do is you're going to take your paint and you're going to mix it with um, equal amounts water. So it's usually about 50-50 and you can experiment with that and make it thicker or a little thinner depending on what you're going for. Um, but you just want a little bit of pigment to a lot of water. And then you're going to take something like pantyhose or cheesecloth. You're going to stretch it over the top opening right here. You're going to pour that, that um, water, that painty water inside. The pantyhose is going to catch any glops, any pieces that might have got stuck in there um, so it doesn't stop up your wand. You put this guy back on, you screw it down, and then you pump it up. And the way it works is you're, you're basically forcing the air out, right? And so um, it's under a lot of pressure. So whenever you hit the trigger on this wand, then a lot of paint's going to spurt out the end of it. And you can change it kind of like a garden hose. You can change how much paint is coming out, how watery it is, how thick, what the droplets look like. And it's a more effective way, I think, um, of doing like a large area of spatter. Also, less likely to hit the people behind you with the spatter um, than with your hand technique. Stipple technique. So using something, the edge of something, um, to lightly brush or move against your surface. Specifically, what you see here is called schlepitschka, and it's a feather technique, although for stippling you could use anything. Um, it's kind of like rag rolling, right? You just find something that has an interesting texture and um, lightly put paint on it and stick it against your surface different ways and you can get something really cool. So you kind of have to be creative. But Schlepitschka uses um, usually um, dusters, like feather dusters, like go down to the dollar store and get just a cheap feather duster. You can attach it like to the end of a piece of bamboo or the end of a um, broom handle. And then you get a little bit of paint on it and you spin it back and forth so that the bristles are lightly hitting your surface. And so you can see somebody doing it by hand here. Here's kind of the finished product. And over here they did it to create rows of corn. So all these were done with Schlepitschka. Here you can see it a little bit better, the dark on dark to get the, the far rows of corn. And they're coming back with a liner and they're lining the stalks and then putting in some, um, some little leaves and stuff for the foreground. Dry brush technique. This is a very commonly used technique. It's good for props. I've used it on costumes. Um, basically, it's you just get your brush a little bit wet, not saturated, um, but just a little wet, and you lightly glide it over your surface so that it hits the high points. So if it has texture, um, like wood grain, it's just going to hit the top, right, and, and bring out a little bit of that texture. So here you can see dry brush in action. Here's an example of painting with dry brush. Notice it just looks kind of scratchy. There's not a whole lot of paint on it. Here is furniture that's been dry brushed, so they use some white to go over gray. Uh, or maybe it's vice versa. It's kind of hard to tell, um, but you could do it either way. You could take a lighter color on top of dark or a darker color on top of light, uh, and it gives you, again, some texture. 
Here they've used it in a set for Pier Ghent. Um, these are just flat boards painted black and then he went over them with um, white so you get a little bit of texture so it looks more wood grain. The last technique I want to talk about is called gridding. And you saw this a little bit in the Jason Edwards video, but if you're taking something small, like a scenic um, uh, set designers, uh, scenic elevations, and you're taking those elevations and you have to blow them up to be a big giant set, like a big backdrop. Well, the best way to do that is called gridding. And this is something that artists have been doing for millennia. So you take your small image and you put a small grid, say one inch by one inch. And then you're going to make a bigger grid on your drop, say three feet by three feet, right? So every one inch on your page, your paper, is going to be three feet in real life. And you look at the points of where your image hits the grid on the small paper and you mark those points on your drop. And then it's essentially like connecting the dots. So you've blown your image up. To a much bigger size. You can see that here they've got a pretty big grid. It looks like it's that's a big grid. <laughs> like it might be like 10 feet across or something. Um, but they're using these lines to um, line up the different areas, the different parts of the, the, the drop and then going through and painting and detailing those sections. All right, this next video I want to show you is um, Playville's get a behind scene look at Broadway's little known scenic paint shop. Oops. Okay, give me one second. So in this video, they'll introduce you to um, Scenic Art Studios. You'll get to see the drops laid out on the floor, which is necessary, especially if you're doing the gridding technique. You have to have access to all of it, and it's easiest just to stand on it um, as you go and work in sections and let them dry, and then come back to that section again later once it's dry. Um, so it's definitely a process. It's not something you just do in one sitting. Good morning. Welcome to Scenic Art Studios. My name is Joseph Forbes. We put out some beautiful backdrops for you to see. Please come in. We have been in this building for approximately three years. Scenic Art Studios has been lucky enough to be in business for 25 years. Over the course of a year, we usually work on about 50 shows. Since we opened the doors 25 years ago, we've worked on over a thousand. We take a designer's concept drawings, and from those concept drawings, we create the entire show. We paint the backdrops in our studios here in Newburgh, and we also paint the built scenery in various locations around the tri-state area. So on any given day, we may have 50 scenics working in three different states. The first piece we're gonna look at today is from a tour of Elf that has been on the road for a number of years and it has been severely damaged. My artists are tracing the drawing from the original drop, and we will take that drawing and create a new drop from it. The show that we have on the floor here is from a production of Beauty and the Beast designed by Stan Meyer. This particular portal was painted at least 10 years ago and was retired from active service. This is a backdrop for a production of Elf that's going back out on tour. Uh, it was painted in the studio originally. It came in in very good shape. Uh, we're just replacing the netting and doing a little bit of touch up and it's going back in. For this particular piece, we had very- I wanna pause it really quickly um, and just point out that this is what's called a cut drop, meaning there's sections of it that are netting that you can see through. So it's not one whole piece. So all of this is netting and um, the little windows down here are netting so you can see through them, see scenery behind it, lights, the cyclorama, gives you more um, 3D effect. Very good artwork. The main issue that you run into is the original artwork is in half inch scale and so he can only show us so much detail. So when we blow the toys up this large, we have to add detail and add interest to keep the, the image working. This is a backdrop from the lovely production of Edwin Drew, designed by Anna Luisos. We have become known for the fact that we paint our backdrops with dye. 
uh, that leaves the fabric very soft and supple and the colors are extremely rich and luminous. And for the grand finale, come see the magic. In Cymbeline, there is a star drop all the way upstage at the climactic moment of the show. The backlights come up and the gods appear in the heavens. So there we can see that their home is in a warehouse, an older warehouse, which is not uncommon um, to convert warehouses into theater spaces um, and into spaces where we create and prepare for theater as well because those kind of spaces are available and cheap. Well I think one thing that's always worth saying is that this is intensely handmade. You never really want the audience to think too much about how did this object come into being, how did the scenery occur. It should be what's on stage and it should make sense but behind that is a tremendous amount of work. And it's really thrilling to make tangible, actual objects that are seen by a large audience. In this context, we are creating distinct settings that are references to the very famous I want to point out right there, they are using um, a pouncing wheel, a tracing wheel and pouncing um, the outline of these mountains. So the tracing wheel made little bitty holes in the paper and the pounce um, allowed them to come through with chalk uh, and create a chalk outline. They're flogging it uh, right here with strips of muslin attached to a pole. Um, so it's lighter, it's not so dark, and then they can use that as their paint outline. References to the very famous 1930s National Park posters. This was a particularly iconic set of images, although this piece is original. It's in the style of these iconic images. So it was really delightful making a new classic. That's great. And so it was like um, an inverted paint by numbers. We made the shapes and then we filled them in. And in this case, they wanted a very printed look and yet still looked handmade. the team did an amazing job. I think we nailed it. Okay, a couple of things that you could see um, in the video. Notice they had stapled the entire edge down as they painted so that it wouldn't wrinkle because um, you add water and paint to fabric and it tends to shrink up and shift and move. Um, they were also using um, garden sprayers, as I mentioned earlier to get some of this kind of spray look, right? So if I go back a little further, see if I can find it. Um, here, you can see that they've masked this off and they use the garden sprayer to go on top of it to get the little bitty droplets, the spatter, and then pull that masking up. Finally, the last one we're going to look at, Star Scenery Painters. The old masters had secretive image projecting devices to help them draw faster and better. So hundreds of- There, I skipped the ad for you. I read that Macbeth is a wonderful comedy if you're a witch. 
and a tragedy if you're anyone else. They're having a lot of fun, the witches. And I thought, well, why shouldn't I make it a playground? So I wanted to do this thing where they can scale up the walls, and then the singers give them critters, they give them dead rats and severed braids and snakes they put in their mouths, and then they climb down and throw them into the cauldron. <laughs> as Broadway and the Metropolitan Opera, but Los Angeles is actually a great place to be a scene painter. Not only is there a ton of TV here, but there is a pretty vibrant theater and opera scene, even if it doesn't draw tourists the way New York does. So when we got the chance to visit with the LA Opera and learn about what goes into their sets and meet their scene painters, we jumped at the chance. What are the challenges for the scene painters? What are you asking them to do that's interesting and challenging? The set is a huge single plane and the wall actually tips towards the audience, you know, so that actually everything has a feeling as if it's plunging into the theater. And I wanted the surface to feel kind of corroded. So if you look at ships that have been abandoned, or if you look at some huge industrial sculptures when they get some age on them. That's the idea, to make it look kind of metallic. So it's a lot of detail, and then trying to make it look like a huge work of art, in a sense, like a painting. We're out here on the streets of Los Angeles, and you are actually painting the sets for Macbeth out here. I have been told these are called the bobbleheads. So tell us a little bit about the bobbleheads. Well, we have an amazing costume shop that sort of uh, constructed and put these uh, for the EC back here together. And uh, what we're doing now is they kind of gave us an example or a sample of one of their painted ones. And we're kind of taking a note from that and kind of moving forward and painting the rest of them, sort of the process that they've given us. What are these going to be used for? Does that matter when you're painting them? It certainly does, because we have to consider the actors who are going to be in them, what kind of paints we're using. Victor, you're holding a paintbrush. It's a Fitch brush. and. We use it for highlights and creating details on the heads. And we can also use it for anything else as well. How are the details of scene painting different from the kind of painting that any of our viewers might have done in their bathroom or in their house? And when you're painting your bathroom or something like that, you're kind of up close and you see those things. But you have to imagine going 30 feet back or so and how that's going to sort of read to the audience. This is our artistic painting, and it's very much into theatrical painting, they call it. And also, most of the painting is not only theatrical, but also is used in television. You're out here working on under bright sunlight, and that's going into a theater. It's going to be under stage lights. How do you compensate for that? I mean, that's one thing that me and Victor have to think about when we were actually out in the, you know, San Fernando Valley painted in direct sunlight. We've got the morning light coming up, the afternoon lights are, it's completely changing as we go. So, you know, we've done these kind of things before. So we sort of try and compensate for the shadow and the light inside of the theater. So we're trying to make the colors pop a little bit more. In the course of constructing this set and then painting this set, how much time did you have? We had about two and a half days for each wall which, you know, I mean, it's a huge wall. So, you know, we didn't have the designer in really until, you know, maybe the second day. So we just kind of had to come up with something quick that thought he would like and be able to sort of adjust from there. So we get it on stage and then we can kind of work with the designer once he sees it under lights. And if he wants to push or pull some of the colors, you know, that's where it really starts to happen is once we get it in the theater. Be bold with the colors. Be bold so they can be seen. Please click like, share this video, and tell us what you think in the comments. We love making these videos, and that's how you can help us keep on making them. So a couple of things um, they mentioned. He mentioned he had a Fitch brush there, that small artist brush. Here he's using a, a broom, essentially, as a brush, and that spatter technique um, on a much larger scale. And then, of course, they're scumbling these colors together on the background, the blues and the, the browns and the grays together. All right, that's about it for scenic painting. I'll see you next time.